you, everybody. Lovely to see the acres upon acres of you receding into the infinite distance and the heights of Mount Tam over there. And yes, just wave. We see you back there. We have telescopes. But, um, this is a very funny event because Peter and I both thought we were interviewing Michael, so I think we're going to have a conversation. But should I fight you for the first question? No, absolutely. Because it was actually for you. Is this so, my microphone? Yep. 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 So. Before you start, can I just uh, say how great it is to be here in one of my favorite bookstores in the world? And. by two of my literary hero, heroes, so it's, uh, it's wonderful. I'm really honored that you, you guys would be willing to do this, so thank you. My pleasure. You're making us look good. <laughs> <laughs> is this on? No. No, no it isn't. We could be in the Borscht Belt the whole evening. <laughs> so, Peter, I wanted to start with you and think about the fact that you were in the midst of kind of the psychedelic revolution of the 1960s. And maybe, maybe you thought you were on the edges of it, but you were around when a lot of what's thought of as the 60s was happening. I know you've had a lot of encounters with psychedelics. And that now, as you, we can tell from your robes, you're a Zen priest. And I wonder how you think about the kind of Dionysian world of psychedelics and the Polonian world of Zen practice, and how much... Well, in the case of our friend Roshi Joan Halifax, she did a lot of psychedelics with Stanislav Grof and then felt she needed to reorder her mind through meditation practice. But kind of how those things relate, and it sort of touches on a larger thing I thought about, that there's an, often an attitude that psychedelics are like taking a helicopter to the mountaintop and spiritual practices, hiking up there on foot. Well, you are still at the mountaintop. Even if you take a helicopter, and, you know nobody would put down. The view is the same. Yeah, nobody would put down a trip to the Grand Canyon. The problem is that it takes a certain amount of um, insistence to fix uh, change in the body. Uh, people think that we meditate for the mind. I tend to think it's more for the body, that the body relaxes and gives up what it's stored in its muscles and ligaments things that were once too important to forget. So I got a lot of value from psychedelics, and when my friends and I were first taking it, we were definitely taking it as spiritual quests. We were not dropping acid and going to the mall. <laughs> but it's also true that you have to have the humility to recognize that problems and dilemmas and conflicts are deeply rooted and you don't shake them loose in one night. And so to me, spiritual practice is a way of grounding psychedelic visions in your body and in your everyday life. You know, one of the things that was really striking to me doing this research was discovering something you, you guys probably know, which is that uh, many of the leading American Buddhists began with psychedelics. Um, Joan Halifax is one example. Um, uh, Jack Kornfeld, um, there's a whole book about this that Stephen Batchelor wrote, and it's, it's very interesting, you know, that without LSD, there might not be American Buddhism. Um, uh, there was, I know that's a kind of an aggressive statement, but, um, but many of the people describe what you said, which is this sense of, this isn't a practice. You can't do this every day. You can't even do it that often. I tried. <laughs> I lived to tell the tale. But there's a lot of interesting parallels between the kind of consciousness that people sometimes attain on psychedelics and what happens with a lot of experienced meditation. And interestingly enough, also, the neuroscience, the, the biology of it, turns out to be the same. Um, when they began imaging the brains of people on psychedelics, they found that this one particular brain network, the default mode network, which is very closely identified with the, the mental functions having to do with self, self-reflection, time travel, uh, theory of mind, uh, were, were, um, went offline, basically. And they did the same fMRIs on really experienced meditators, people with 10,000 hours or more, and their brain scans looked almost identical. So there are, there are some really interesting lines of connection that was one of the most valuable things that I took from your book was understanding the default uh, mode network 
And it, it makes sense. I mean, how could our Paleolithic ancestors have been gazing at butterflies, you know, when saber-toothed tigers were creeping up behind them? You need a certain amount of focus to protect this body. Yeah. And the fact that we had a mechanism to keep us straight, I found really compelling. Yeah, and, and it, it really seems to be the home of the ego, to the extent that uh -huh. the ego has one. And, um, uh, and the fact that you can turn it off, I think, is really interesting. And when you do, interesting things happen in the brain, which is brain networks that don't normally communicate with one another, that normally go through that regulator, because the default mode net network is at the top of the hierarchy regulator, they start talking to each other directly. And there's an image in the book of, of that remapped brain. And the brain is, is literally rewired for the length of the, the trip, and it's rewired in experienced meditators in a more permanent way. This was, this was Carhart Harris's? Yeah, Robin Carhart Harris, who's an English uh, neuroscientist, who's one of the characters in the book, and I think he's a, a, a brilliant scientist. So you mentioned something about, um, you talked about hot searches for information. And would you talk a little bit about the, the connection between children under five and children on psychedelics? Yeah, one of the most provocative statements from someone I interviewed was uh, from Alison Gopnik, uh, who is a, uh, a child psychologist at, uh, on the faculty at Berkeley. And she, um, she thinks psychedelic experience basically returns the mind to a very childlike state. And that we have, there are two basic forms of consciousness. Um, one is, one she calls spotlight consciousness. This is the ability to focus and block, suppress peripheral information, focus. It's very good for reasoning, it's very good for work. It gets books written and all this kind of stuff. It's very useful. It's an adult form of consciousness. And then there's uh, lantern consciousness, which illuminates the world in a more global way. And kids, you know, don't focus very well, but they take in information from all these different places. And that often allows them to make these incredible connections that adults can't make. And she's done all these interesting experiments with kids, problem solving. And if you set a problem for kids, uh, to give you this gets back to your point about uh, hot searches, if you uh, create a game for kids, she, it's called, she, does something called a blicket detector, where if you put a block on top of this box in a certain way, fitting in a certain pattern, you get all this music and light and everything. It's very exciting. Um, and kids can figure it out, and adults can figure it out pretty quickly. But if she changes the rules in an unpredictable way, such that you actually now need two blocks to make it happen, the kids will figure it out first, because they're willing to try a lot of crazy solutions. And adults tend to um, reach for the solution that, that worked best last time. We're all about precedent, mental precedent. And it's, it's sort of the way AI works, artificial intelligence. You, you train this machine and there's, uh, there's you know, a thousand, there's a, a, a kind of space of possibility. And there are close by ones that take very little energy to try. And then there are the crazy ones way out on the horizon. And that's often where brilliance lies and novelty, but it's also, a lot of wasted effort. For it, very Explain often. the twenty-first century. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, psychedelics, if, if if Allison's right, kind of puts you back in that head where you do make hotter searches um, and uh, make connections that you might not otherwise. Why are they called hotter? Because it takes more energy. Oh. Um, you know, whenever you're doing a computer thing, you know, the, the further out you have to go, I guess. Uses uh -huh. more electricity. I don't really know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> How did I think about it? That was, so, that was so authoritative. I do that all the time. And I just hope no one will bust me. <laughs> and you did it in front of 400 people. <laughs> I thought it deserves applause. <laughs> yeah, I promise to tell you what I don't know. It's sort of interesting that you're touching on that because I was thinking about the way that all the ways that kind of the digital age and computers encourage us to kind of bunker down into what we already know, what we already, the people we already agree with, you know, create these avatars and really kind of like buckle on the ego really hard and go for it. And so I often ask myself, well, what's the opposite of a thing to try and define what the thing is? And it's interesting thinking about 
about the online world as being kind of the opposite, opposite of these experiences in a lot of ways. Which might explain the interest of people in Silicon Valley and psychedelics. I mean, they're yeah. the most committed to this work um, in a really serious way, these young founders. And um, I, I, actually, Judith and I, my wife got some insight into this. We met a guy who was all of 32 and had sold his company for $800 million. And, um, and Judith asked him, we were at Benefit together, uh, why, did he, why was he so interested in psychedelics? And he said, well, he had had his first trip on psilocybin or something, and he went to a museum, and his, it was a video gaming company, and, he, and since he was eight, he was just obsessed with video games, and it, you know, it was his whole life. But he looked up for the first time from the screen, and he saw paintings. And he said, I had no idea that there was emotion in painting. <laughs> and his interest in video games faded. And now, now, of course, he can afford to buy a lot of really great art with $800 million. Um, so it was a convenient time. But I do think, it, for some people, it has been an antidote to being in that, in that box. It's funny that Psych I don't psychedelics want to get, are the psychedelics. Psychedelics. Yeah. I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole of my antipathy to Silicon Valley, but it is kind of fascinating <laughs> that you know they they're interested for themselves in all these ways of opening up, but they're giving us all these ways of shutting down. <laughs> what would a psychedelic? What, what would a spiritual, open-hearted, you know? Yeah, well, there was, you know, there's a very long history of, of psychedelics in Silicon yeah. Valley. It, it's not, it doesn't begin with Steve Jobs and oh, his I know. LSD trips. Yeah. It goes back to the early 50s, and these engineers had a company called Antax, which was really the first Silicon Valley company. They made a magnetic recording tape mm -hmm. uh, for both computers and, and audio recording. And um, this character in the book named Al Hubbard, who's a very mysterious guy, uh, was a kind of a psychedelic evangelist in the 50s. He got, he'd had this angelic visitation, and this angel told him he could be involved in something that would change the course of civilization. He realizes, he reads an article a couple months later, it's LSD, he hadn't heard of it. He went and got it, he tried it, and he realized this is it, this is going to change civilizations. But he had a very elitist idea of how to use it. He, he didn't want everyone to use it. He thought it was too dangerous. He just wanted the, the best and brightest. So. <laughs> He went to the Catholic Church, he got various bishops to use it, he went to the government, he went, he went all over, and he had a little satchel full of LSD. And, um, but he also went to these, these pioneering engineers who were doing the first uh, computer chips, and, uh, and, and he turned on a couple of engineers at Ampex, and they determined that they wanted to be the first psychedelic corporation. Yeah. And uh, so he started this going into their management suite and, and, and tripping people, he called it. Remember, it's legal then. This is the 1950s. Yeah. And, um, but he was a Catholic mystic, and he insisted on bringing images of Mary and the crucifixion with him to these trips. And the president was fun. Yeah. <laughs> and the president was Jewish. <laughs> And so the president of the company just threw him out. So that's why we don't have that company. <laughs> Blame it on the Jews. <laughs> you know, in, uh, in the 50s also, uh, admirals were taking LSD and practicing war games. And there was lots of knowledge of this around the Pentagon. And I've often asked myself in times past, if Tim Leary wasn't sometimes a continuation of that public experiment, someone I knew well and who's um, and he went to West Point, by the way. who's loose and married a CIA agent, and whose looseness with this very potent stuff. I mean, let's not forget that everything has a shadow. One of my closest friends was a guy named Brooks Butcher, tall, <coughs> handsome, charming, fantastic young man, one of the first founders of the Digger who clawed both his eyes out on an acid trip one night and then drowned climbing the fence of the Asaint Asylum where they put him, trying to escape. And this was as healthy a person as I knew. So if you take LSD enough, you will be visited by your demons. And the idea that you could just do this in an unstructured way and just give it out struck me at the time that somebody was supervising an experiment. Mm. Someone was watching to see, well, you know, for instance, do you know what the Japanese policy on genetically modified foods is? Mm. 
to watch the Americans for 25 years. <laughs> That's their policy. Because we hook everything to marketing, and we're experimenting on our people. We don't know what it means to take GMOs, and the Japanese are going to wait and watch us for 25 years. We're coming up on 25 years. I'd be curious to know what they do. Um, I think you're right about the, uh, absolutely right about the shadow. Uh, there was a horrible story in the news um, just the other day of uh, somebody in, um, somewhere in Sonoma County? Bodega Bay. Bay. Who, who, who was tripping, supposedly, and um, went nuts and ran down a few people with his car. And um, it was just a, just a horrible story. These things happen. I mean, one of the... One of the really important lessons of the 60s, which was a kind of experiment, um, unsupervised experiment, although the CIA was keeping an eye on everything, yeah. apparently, um, <laughs> but what is that, you know, when these molecules arrived in the West, they didn't come with an instruction manual. Um, we didn't have a long tradition the way they do in Mexico or the way they do with ayahuasca in South America. And, um, and no one knew quite how to use them. And there was a lot of uh, reckless use. I mean, you know, I, I'm really struck now by the fact that so many people were dosed without their knowledge or permission. I mean, that strikes me as an incredibly cruel thing. And that was, you know, that, that happened. That happened to parties and in the Grateful Dead's green room and all these kind of places. And yeah, we had children dosed at a commune, you know, got into the pie. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it was horrifying. Yeah. So, in your book, you talk about taking. Um, I forget, was it mushrooms you took the first time? Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that I can remember as a pretty constant thing from at least 200 acid trips was a feeling, no matter how ecstatic, and I never really had too many bad trips, but that something could go wrong. Mm -hmm. There was that knife-edged feeling. And yet I've never had that experience on peyote or with mushrooms or with totally organic chemicals, and I wonder if you heard or experienced anything like that. Oh, I've heard that from a lot of people. I think that there is, and I don't know if that's expectation, you know, I mean, one of the key things, and Leary's great insight, I think, about psychedelics was that the experience is, is dramatically shaped by set and setting, the, both the internal and the external environment when you're doing it, and I think that we have a kind of confidence in the products of nature that they're not going to fuck us up too much. And, um, but it may really be true, too. I mean, you know, we know refined drugs. I mean, coca leaves, for example, people can use with, yeah. with, uh, with out risk of addiction or serious problems. Yet the more you refine a drug, make it more powerful, the more problems you have. So there may be something to it. Um, but the, uh, you know, I think we have to look at the 60s use of psychedelics. As, you know, there have been three big chapters in the West's uh, approach to psychedelics, and that's chapter two. Um, chapter one was this, and this was a big surprise that this even happened, was this very lively and productive and successful period of research from the invention of LSD in the, in the 40s to up until the backlash in the late 60s. Um, that it was, it, was a, it was studied in universities and, and, and in a very serious way trying to figure out what it was good for. And then you have this period where it enters the counterculture, and it's a and it's a, obviously a very mixed record. I mean, they're very. I think there were a lot of positive experiences that came out of it, and it, um, I think it did shape the '60s in important ways. We can talk more about that. And then you then it kind of disappears, at least from public attention, for 30 years. I mean, there's no more research. People are still using LSD, but quietly. And uh, and then you have this renaissance. Um, and in a way, the book, fo although I take you through that history, I really focus on that renaissance. How did it get started? And it really is a resumption of that pre-60s period of using the drugs in a very intentional way, with always with guides um, and with this protocol uh, that seems to mitigate a lot of the risk. Uh, because you're supervised, somebody's with you the whole time, you're prepared very carefully uh, and, and given advice on what to do if you do get into a really dark and nasty place. Um, the fact that you should surrender to it and not fight it is a very important piece of advice you're given. And then after the, after the experience, oh, and also you're, you're wearing eye shades and you're, you're lying down and you're listening to music on headphones. So it's a very internalized experience and Although the molecule's the same, 
almost everything about the experience is different because of those two technologies. It's really interesting what the eye shades do. So one thing that you make me think about is that, um, without being romantic about it, natural plants have many buffers. Yeah. Um, I worked once for four months at 12,000 feet in Bolivia, and I ate coca leaves every day. And when you think about a handful of coca leaves that you chew with acid ash or something, and then they take 10 kilos, and they mix it with kerosene and soap, and they turn it into a gram of cocaine, there's something about the very purity of it, which is its own danger. And so the confidence that I always had with natural plants was they had 25 million years of evolution. And they kind of balanced it out. And in, in, when you took acid, you hoped the chemist cleaned the pot. Yeah. Right. One of the reasons I stopped shooting heroin was because a synthetic heroin was running around the Haight-Ashbury, and if you took it once, you got Parkinson's disease. Some molecule was wonky in it. And so whenever I look at a pill or something like that, you're just putting your faith in the... Quality of the chemistry. Yeah, quality well, of we're the seeing chemistry. that now with generic drugs, right? It's a book that came out about the generic, generic drugs made in, I think, in India and China, and how sloppily they're made. And we're all thinking of <laughs> Where do we go from there? <laughs> that might be a cul-de-sac. Go back to the main road. Okay, okay, with all the superhighway, uh, uh, which sounds like an Al Gore metaphor for the internet, but I digress. So, you know, and one of the things that, looking at the book again, it came up for me, it's like, what are, you know, you talk again, it comes up again and again how, in these experiences, the ego disappears or is suspended. You have this beautiful description deep in the book. The sovereign ego with all its armaments and fears, its backward-looking uh, resentments and forward-looking worries was simply no more, and there was no one left to mourn its passing. Yet something had succeeded it, this bare disembodied awareness, which gazed upon the scene of the self's disillusion with benign indifference. I was present to reality, but as something other than myself, what are, what, are, what are egos for? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Like what, well, that, what, that what are more benign and less benign? Well, I can tell you it's really pretty straightforward. They tell you to brush your teeth, to cross at the green, to take care of yourself, to get some sleep. They're survival mechanisms for an individuated consciousness. They're not necessarily bad. It's our attachment to it that makes it problematic. I couldn't have said it more, uh, more eloquently. No, I think, I mean, egos have evolved for a very good reason. And um, they, they help us uh, do the basics of, uh, you know, reproduction, survival. I mean, all those Darwinian tasks, they're, they're, they're very helpful with. Um, to one degree or another, I think though some cultures have more um, overdeveloped egos than others. And ours is particularly, we're a highly individualistic society. Um, but I think most of us, I mean, the, the sentence you read in a way is the very climax of the book. For me, that was the, the high point of, that, that was my the big thing I learned, even though I yeah. still don't understand what I learned. <laughs> but I still puzzle over what exactly happened. And specifically, what was that viewpoint that succeeded the ego? From what vantage was I observing this dissolution of self? And... You know, is it some manifestation of a transpersonal consciousness? I tend to, I tend to doubt that, um, but I, but it might be. Huxley said it was the mind at large. I mean, that that, that you got in touch with at that moment. But the main takeaway for me, I mean, I, I'm really curious to know who that other person is, uh, who's in there. Um, but the, 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 suppose it's just awareness itself. It may be just awareness itself, and and maybe to say a vantage might be wrong. I don't know. I, I, but it, it felt like it was a, a place to stand, and it was a different place to stand. And um, but what the, the the teaching is that you're not identical to your ego. You don't have to listen to it all the time or be it all the time, and that it is one character in this drama in your head, and it is useful at certain times. Um, but to gain a little distance on it is is really freeing. Um, Non-attachment, so, as we say in Buddhism. Non-attachment, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, what I've read of Buddhist thought has done more to help me explain that moment than, you know, 
talking to psychologists or neuroscientists. Fortunately, you have a Buddhist priest holding a microphone. Who right. has a question <laughs> right. about Buddhism? So you have this line, which I really I, I appreciate. You said the journeys have shown me what the Buddhists try to tell us, but I've never really understood that there's much more to consciousness than the ego, as we would see if we just shut up. <laughs> if we just shut up. Yeah, it was just it's great, but I felt uh, honor bound to say. Actually, the Buddhists are telling us much more than that. The Buddhists are telling us the efficacy of discipline, the efficacy of rigor. Uh, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So we sit with these very formal postures so that our minds can be free. And one of the things that um, I think I probably share this same worry with you in the book, there is this temptation in this highly individuated culture to say, whatever I can use for an edge will be great. Mm -hmm. If I can drop some acid and get a new uh, game, get a new app, get a new nothing, something, uh, I'll be out ahead. And so there's a part of me that wonders when you drop psychedelics in this culture, outside of community, with all these individuated consciousnesses, each looking for itself, I have an intuition, I can't prove it, but I have an intuition that it actually counteracts one of the deepest benefits of the psychedelic experience. Because we always return, and until I know how to deal with you straight, with affection and compassion and putting you first and myself second, no change is baked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, what well, yeah, what endures is a real question, and a lot of psychedelic experiences are evanescent, but I have talked to too many people whose lives were changed by a single psychedelic experience. I don't know that necessarily in the spiritual sense you're talking about, um, but these are, you know, a lot of the book was looking at the therapeutic uses of psychedelics, and I talked to a lot of people who had uh, terminal cancer diagnoses or, or, you know, just paralyzing anxiety around their cancer, and many of them about three quarters of them had um, a, a mystical experience of such power that it kind of reset their understanding of their mortality and, and completely removed their fear. So it needn't be evanescent. I think it depends on the, the container it's in and how well it's supported and who's guiding you. I mean, the drugs are kind of unspecific in what they do also. And um, that experience can be shaped. And, and I think that that's really important. Um, so I don't think we can say, you know, in general that um, these experiences, you know, don't take root. No, um, sometimes they do, but not always. They don't have, there's, no, there's no reason they have to. I would not have become a Buddhist if it were not for psychedelics. Mm -hmm. They changed my life radically. Mm -hmm. But stepping back from an individual experience to an experience writ large always makes me want to be cautious. Yeah. Oh, I agree. It's dangerous to generalize um, without question. And on this question of ego, one of the great ironies of psychedelic culture is uh, how many people have had these profound psychedelic experiences and emerged as complete egotists. <laughs> this is a paradox. Um, you have, you know, Timothy Leary is the great example, right? He There's, just was, that's who he was before, though. He was, but it got, it got a lot worse. Disinhibition? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I'm sure it's partly disinhibition, but I mean, it's, it's funny, I find, I, I hear this kind of barely sus uh, repressed uh, exuberance about the power of psychedelics to change the world, even amongst the most sober scientists. And they know better than to talk to anybody about it. But you get them out for a drink and they'll start talking about, we need this to save the planet. And um, so it's an occupational hazard of psychedelics. They said that about atomic energy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it is. But I mean, I think the paradox has to do with the fact that you have a big spiritual experience and you, you think you, you possess the key, right? The key to, to the universe. And, um, and you want to tell the world about it. The answer. The answer, yeah. 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 And that's, that's always dangerous. I guess something that's also interesting to me, I spent the morning with a friend who's taken a lot of psychedelics, and we're talking about, and who's a, a fabulous human being, and uh, we're talking about 
all the things that might have existed in this culture, that exist in other cultures, might have existed in ours at an earlier time, that were ecstatic and communal and connecting and kind of antithesis of the individual isolated ego and the kind of atrophy of those things. And one of the concerns I have about the way people might want to think about psychedelics, we like quick fixes. I mean, there's this idea that, you know, like with Me Too, we're going to put 17 bad guys in prison and then violence against women will be over when obviously we need to change the whole culture, um, you know, from the bottom up and in all across. And it's interesting, maybe, I w is there a way in which people want this to be a kind of intervention tool, quick yeah. fix? There's a lot of people who um, are interested right now, I mean, I don't think it's an accident that we're having this revival of interest in psychedelics at a moment of incredible cultural and uh, environmental crisis. Um, and, you know, one of the striking things about psychedelics is, in many people, the experience really addresses uh, some of the problems we face as a society. Um, I mean, if you conceive of those big problems as I do, which is the environmental crisis, and tribalism, um, these two, which are both the product of egoic consciousness in, in one way or another, um, that's exactly what psychedelics address. People emerge from these experiences very often with a powerful sense of connectedness to nature. I mean, in that, that first experience that you alluded to, I walked through my garden and I saw it with eyes I'd never seen it, and that the plants were as aware as I was, and they were returning my gaze, and for the first time in my life, I felt entirely, well, maybe when I was four, I don't know, but entirely a part of this community of species that was all these plants and animals in my garden. Um, and this has been tested. I mean, they've done, you know, the psychologists have these scales. They have a nature connectedness scale where they measure how much do you feel you're part of nature, how much do you feel you stand outside nature. And those scales change on, after a single psilocybin uh, experience. You feel much more connected. Likewise, your tolerance for authoritarianism goes down. So that's interesting. You, you just got an idea, right? Um, um, I've heard this question. What? <laughs> but you can think of people that you could. Um, oh yeah. So, so in a way, and and you know, I see those phenomena as similar. They're both about erecting walls against the other. It's just a different other. You know, one other is the natural world. Another other are people of different faiths, different religions, different genders. Um, and that as those walls go down and you feel more connected, that's, it's exactly what we need. But it's very glib to think that we could get there. I mean, that you you know, you can't prescribe a drug to an entire culture. Um, this is not fluoride, you know. We're not going to put LSD in the water. And, and the fact is, it works on people who want it to work. Um, that's why your idea of giving it to the president, which I could, I could hear you thinking, uh, is not going to work. Let's just recalibrate that. Let's recalibrate that. He has the nuclear codes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Giving acid to a sociopath with the nuclear codes. <laughs> so I want to talk 25,000 feet for a minute and go back to the 17th century and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution collided with the um, agrarian culture that preceded it, you had a, uh, a scandal with gin. Gin became the chemical, became crack cocaine of the time. Women were giving their babies away to get gin. Hogarth was doing etchings of people out. It was like some kind of cushion, some kind of uh, response to shock, depression. We can look at opioids that way. We can also look at psychedelics re-emerging at this time where Trump has reinvigorated the mechanical worldview as we were shifting into a cybernetic worldview. So it looked like the accomplishment had been made, right? It looked like Apple, we all have phones and everything's groovy. And then this guy comes along and it's coal and it's machines and it's the graft of the 1950s and bingo, 
acid comes back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason. I mean, there's, you know, it's very hard to understand the zeitgeist when you're in it. Um, but I think we'll understand this better in a few years. But I don't think it's an accident that there's so much interest in this topic. I right wanted now. to read one thing you wrote, which is one of my favorite quotes in the book. You said, I now understand exactly what these writers, Emerson, Whitman, and Tennyson, were talking about their own mystical experiences. Formally inert, their words now emitted a new ray of relation. Such emissions had always been present in our world, flowing through literature and religion. But like electromagnetic waves, they couldn't be understood without kind of a receiver. So Gary Snyder talks all the time about the great underground. And the great underground is a parallel force to the history of cities and nation states and it's made up of priestesses and yogans and craftsmen and artists and musicians and sometimes it emerges as it did in the 60s as it did in the 20s it's always present it's eternal uh, people in the great underground tend to reserve their sexuality for themselves they let their hair grow long people in the nation state cut their hair and give it to the state so I don't know where in the, in the bounce we are right now. The 60s was very obviously an emergence of the great underground. Mm -hmm. And what strikes me as complicated now is that the, the force that through the green fuse drives the flower is emerging in the midst of this highly industrialized, cybernetic uh, city culture. Couldn't be less natural. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. No, I, I, I mean, I think you, that might well be right. Um, that might well be right. I don't have a lot to add to that. Um, you know, when I was describing those, those writers, um, it, it was really a reflection of how spiritually underdeveloped I was before I undertook this, this adventure. Um, that I could read about, you know, Emerson on the Green and the Boston Common and he, he was a transparent eyeball, and the currents of nature and spirit were just passing through him, and it just sat there. It was just dead on the page to me. And, um, and then I picked it up again, and I was like, oh, yeah, I get it. Don't you wonder what he was taking? <laughs> yeah, transcendentalists. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, I mean, mystical experience is, is, uh, is always around. Um, more and less common at different times in history, but it had been completely unavailable to me. Um, so for me, it was an important tool. Maybe one more question before we turn it over to the audience. Michael, one of the amazing things about your work is, I know a lot of us write things and you kind of can't tell if anyone ever read them or if anything happens. Like I remember you did the piece about grass-fed beef versus feedlot beef in the New York Times. Sunday Magazine and like educated a huge number of people and almost created a market for it. I'm curious what the pr practical impact of this book has been, other than lots of people asking you for connections <laughs> that he is not here to offer, so do not even try. This is not an available service tonight. <laughs> but I wonder what, you know, kind of the popular response and the way people are, are thinking about it. Is it helping the research or driving the research? Do you see that? And also, just what was happening anyway? Has the research continued and gone forward since this book? Yeah. Um, so, it's been incredibly gratifying to publish this book, and I was I was very nervous about it. I mean, people expected a certain, you know, probably expected another food book from me, and you know, it's a different kind of mushroom. Um, but. Um, Fortunately, people were open to it, and, and, and readers who read me about food and health were happy to come along for this ride, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. The effect has been uh, to, I think, in many circles, legitimize psychedelic research, and that gratifies me the most. Um, the researchers tell me that they're getting funded. Um, and that there is a lot of new psychedelic research getting started, which is going to, you know, we haven't talked that much about mental health, but in the short term, the most important value here is that there, there, we have a mental health crisis in this country, and we need some new tools. Psychiatry is really in crisis, and um, we may have some powerful uh, tools to address things like depression, uh, anxiety, 
uh, you know, eating disorders, um, you know, and, and the people near death. I mean, something to really offer them. We have very little to offer them except morphine. Um, so that's a huge deal, and to see that, and that research is not supported by our government, not a penny uh, from the NIH. Um, so it's all been privately funded, and one of the most gratifying things is to hear from people who, I read your book and I wrote a check for a million dollars. You know, I mean, those are the people who are stepping up, and I think that's that's really satisfying. I'm also finding that mainstream. Uh, in that case, um, to the researchers at Johns Hopkins, um, the, the person I'm thinking of, uh, but there's research going on at Johns Hopkins, at NYU, at UCSF. Um, there will be research going on at um, Stanford very soon. There are drug trials getting started to, um, to <coughs> test psy uh, psilocybin on treatment-resistant depression and major, major depression. Uh, there are trials of alcoholism, of cocaine addiction going on right now. There are people who want to uh, look at opiate addiction. Um, the work with addiction is quite amazing. I mean, this may be a powerful tool for behavior change. Uh, and, and changing adult behavior is incredibly difficult. Um, so I feel gratified to have made some small contribution to that. You know, as journalists, I mean, you know this well, we we strive to be kind of short-term visionaries, right? I mean, to just look around corners a little bit. Um, if you if you get too far out ahead, no one knows what the fuck you're talking about. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so this, I, when I first started reading about this research, I thought this is, this is interesting. Maybe this is the next thing in, in this in this realm. And, and um, you know, there's, it seems to be the case. So I, I've been, it's been a really gratifying experience as a writer. To, I mean, to make, whenever you make any difference, when, when, you, when you change any minds, um, it's, uh, it's why we do it. Well, it's, we're really glad you came to our side. Which we are you speaking for, Peter? You've been so many, well, you, you've been through so many we's, uh, yeah. as a mime troop which, and digger yeah, and, like the, and priest and an old movie hippie. star. Okay. <laughs> Official old hippie status accepted. I also, I, I'm not sure this needs to be brought up. I just keep thinking about what are the cultural practices. I'm Peter, and I have been mentioning Buddhism, but the ways that practices get integrated into everyday life, etc. That I don't want to make say like make these things more unnecessary in the sense that like they're bad things and we shouldn't go to them. But it does feel like there are. You know, it feels like the culture is so bereft of other ways to kind of let go of your ego, feel boundless connection, have epiphanies, become... Because there are many technologies yeah, that, that yeah. do that, and, and activities, and there are people who can have mystical experiences spontaneously, or in nature, the experience of awe in Yosemite, or um, physical risk gives it to some yeah. people. Flow. I mean, flow yeah. is really another yeah. example of that. But I think the most relevant one here, and, and the natural transition from psychedelics, is into meditation. Mm -hmm. um, in my own experience, I was a really um, poor meditator, had a lot of trouble quieting my thoughts, and was very impatient with it. And um, the, my experience with psychedelics gave me a sense of where I was trying to be, and, and I recognize the territory when I return to it, and that that's been, it's, it, I think it's a really, I mean, I actually talked to a psychiatrist who studies meditation, not psychedelics, and he, although he had psychedelic experience, and he, he, he said he could imagine a day where we used a psychedelic experience to kickstart a meditation practice. And there's a certain logic in that, uh, I think. I think, it, you know, it, it is a shortcut, um, but a useful one in that way. And, so that seems to me the way you incorporate it in a practice, um, in, in the most productive way. So the helicopter trip helps you hike up the mountain afterwards. You know where you're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know why you want to be on top. Right. Peter, did you have other questions or comments or? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there are people in the audience. Oh yeah, this and is not get to questions. I, I'd rather turn it over to let other people speak. Out. Okay, and we're going to ask for a question. I know a lot of people have had extraordinary experiences that they would love to tell Michael about, but there's 400 of you. So we're hoping that your questions are questions. And you who are standing up with the sunglasses, 
question, and I'll repeat the questions because I have a microphone. Okay, so my question is, what do you recommend to start with? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a second Yeah, oh yeah. I'm so sorry. the question was like, which substance does he recommend you start with? <laughs> um, I I I not knowing you, yeah, not knowing you, uh, I would be really reluctant to make any kind of recommendations. In my own case, uh, I started with mushrooms, which is a relatively gentle way to start compared to, say, LSD or 5-MeO-DMT, which I, I will not recommend anyone do. This is the smoked venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. And it's, a, it's a quite a, I mean, you overshoot the mountain by a lot. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, there was a kind of, I mean, I think a lot of people start with psilocybin, which is the same as magic mushrooms, by the way. Um, and you can, you know, start, I mean, my advice would be start with a low dose. Don't do a high dose alone. Um, I think that's really, and approach it with reverence. It's, it's a very consequential thing to do. I suspect more of your advice would be about the setting and having oh, a guide yeah, and things you. like that. Well, you know, a, a guide is really important, and I think, it, as I said earlier, it really mitigates risk. It makes you feel safe. I think especially as we get older, you know, 20-year-olds are very reckless, right? I mean, <laughs> they, they really haven't, their judgment hasn't totally formed. It's no accident that those are the people who use these drugs with abandon very often. Um, as you get older, you have you have a sense of what is being risked. And um, and so, doing it in a safe environment, I never would have uh, had an experience. I never would have let my ego dissolve had I not felt completely safe in this room uh, with this woman who was my guide. Um, and, you know, I would have resisted it and it would have really gotten ugly um, because it was going to happen. And um, so safety, I think, and comfort is really, really important. And if you are going to seek a guide, make sure you have a rapport with them. I mean, I met people I would not entrust my brain to, and they're, they're all over. Um, and um, so make sure you have a good feeling about this person, because you are entrusting them with something really important. Right here. <laughs> OK, don't. So yeah, I, I, I tend to look always at the dark side. Uh, did, did, did it occur to you that we may, if, if there are bad actors in government, for instance, that they will use it to turn us into a social insect type society, controlled by hormones and controlled by hormones? So um, a friend who has, says he has a dark worldview asks whether and these... He does, by the way. <laughs> he does. Asks whether these could be used by governments to... How would you... Create an insect-based society controlled by hormones and pheromones. Yes. I have to say, I haven't worried about that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, the individual vanishes, right? And the hive or the, the colony has power. I don't want to be like that. Um, and there's a lot of positive things we can say about individuality. Um, look. The drugs are really fungible. Um, in different settings, they can do different things. And we all assume, because we were told that all the CIA's <laughs> research failed. Um, and one of the things they were doing was mind control. And, and throwing people out the window. Yes, there was. That, that was. But that may not have been an LSD experiment. Um, <laughs> LSD may have been a cover for what was That's really right. going on there. Um, so, but. You know, the, so we have explored dark uses of these drugs. The CIA, in a program called MK Ultra, sometimes called Project Artichoke, for reasons <laughs> known only to the CIA, uh, looked at LSD as uh, they tried to weaponize it. Essentially, it was going to be a bioweapon at one point. It was going to be a truth serum at another point. It was going to uh, be something uh, that you could use to control people's thoughts. I have to say it's not out of the question. I, I think approached with 
bad intention, uh, the drugs are very powerful. There is the case of, um, sorry, I just flooded my mind, the mass murderer, uh, Charles Manson, uh, who apparently used LSD to control his posse. Um, so it's not out of the question. I, I, I think that these are tools, and, and in, in evil hands they might do evil things. But insect mind, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There's one thing that we don't look at exactly. There are, there are two great social experiments going on on the planet. One is not an experiment. For most of human history, we have lived tribally. We've lived in small enclaves of people who were intimate and often blood-related, and psychology was developed around the survival of the group. The idea of like a personal victory was just unspeakable. Right. And so we are taking these drugs, and I'm not, I'm not prudish about them at all, but the background against which we're doing it is 200 some odd years of rugged individualism. Do your thing, fight for freedom. There was a great Zen master called Hakuin, who had many, many uh, Kensho experiences, enlightenment experiences. But his final uh, enlightenment experience made him realize that it was actually Buddha's eightfold path that was enlightenment. Living in a community and taking care of that community. You didn't have to chase some other state of mind that was outside yourself. And so one of the things that um, I think about sometimes is, unless we change the forms of society, and I don't mean to sound like a Marxist, but we're, we're throwing uh, healthy goldfish into polluted water. We're taking this sacramental uh, substance and we're putting it into an individuated political understanding. And it seems to me the leap that we have to take is to begin to create community understandings where survival is a community idea. learned about the certificate program in psychedelic assisted therapies and research in your book and I'm now part of the fourth cohort at CIIS getting that certificate and so I thank you first of all deeply. I just finished a week-long residential retreat during which we watched training videos of the phase one and phase two clinical trials of MDMA and saw the trauma measures whether it was an Iraqi war vet or a 9-11 paramedic and the fact that we're keeping these medications from people is, is, is just really rough. And my question of you is, programs like, there must have been about 100 of us in this program. It was MAPS trainees, um, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And I was wondering, what schools and what programs do you personally think um, would be most worthy if there's such a, a you know, way to look at it, of support, other than Hawkins and in your experience, which do you support or which would you recommend people could try to help more if people yeah, get trained? Yeah, people can't hear We're going to repeat the question. question. Well, that's the first question. Yeah, so, um, well, the question is about training to become a psychedelic therapist, which is actually now something you can do in this area. There's a program at the California Institute for Integral Studies. Uh, the woman who asked the question is in the fourth cohort there. They're training people to be psychedelic therapists because there is a, a demand for them because of all these trials and, and the expectation that in a few years, MDMA or ecstasy, which is not technically a psychedelic but is also being studied in this wave of research, and psilocybin will be approved by the FDA within the next five years. A lot of people think that that's a realistic time frame. And there's going to be an enormous demand for people who conduct that therapy. There are not a lot of training programs available. Uh, MAPS is, is an organization, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. They have been pushing to bring back this research since 1987. Rick Doblin is the head of it, and, uh, and he deserves a lot of credit for taking things as far as they've come. Uh, they're doing their own training program. And then you have CIIS. I don't know of any others. I think some of the universities train their own people. Um, I think you already need some sort of therapeutic license uh, before you can be in the CIAS program. Um, you know, the, the work with MDMA, which is ecstasy, is, is, is very promising. Uh, and that is being used to treat trauma, uh, PTSD specifically, in victims of sexual abuse and in war 
uh, war veterans, uh, and it's had remarkable effects. It's a different kind of experience, um, but it also, like psychedelics, um, breaks habits of thought. I mean, you can you can unify them around that. The fact that people are stuck with their habit energies, uh, and and sometimes those are very very negative, and that this is a this dissolves a, a lot of those um, forms uh, temporarily, but then you can. Having had the experience, you can build on it with therapeutic support. Um, so, you know, things may look very different in just five years. Um, and if this, you know, unless there is another backlash, and it's not out of the question, um, something bad could happen that would cast a light on this, a dark light on this research. Uh, I worry that there's a, there, hundreds of people are going to be trialed who are depressed, seriously depressed people. and odds are one or two or three of them will commit suicide somewhere along the way. And this will get associated with psychedelics, because that's a meme Again. in the culture, right? Again, yeah. Um, of course, people, people commit suicide on SSRIs or getting off SSRIs all the time, and it's not a story. This will be a story. Um, so I, I think everybody still has to be really careful and cautious about it. And, and if I've learned anything in a year of talking about this, it is to be a little less exuberant um, uh, than I think I was at the beginning. Um, just because I've heard, I've heard really dark stories, I, I think there's another threat here of sexual abuse in the, in the therapeutic relationship here, especially with MDMA, which creates such a bond of trust with the therapist that an unscrupulous therapist could take advantage of somebody uh, very easily. And indeed, that has happened. And of course, the, that already happens in therapeutic relationships. That's right, without, without <laughs> the therapy. Right. I want to take the young woman all the way at the back, and then this guy. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if you apply the concept of trust like going in the open to your everyday life, or is it just when you're intentionally using it? Well, a very, you know, well-framed short question. question. Yeah. And then two, will you sign my book? <laughs> <laughs> I did already. I, you should no, open it. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it after we're done. <laughs> By the way, the rest of you, I don't know if you know, but you see you have a signed copy of my book? Yeah. I use a very special ink. <laughs> uh, the question was, I talk about the, um, I talk about this mantra of, of trust, be open, and let go. And do, do I only use that when I'm using psychedelics or in other times? I mean, one of the interesting things I've thought about a lot is how the advice that you get in the flight instructions before you have your journey, like trust, let op be open, let go, or relax and let your mind float downstream, as John Lennon put it, um, uh, or surrender, I mean, these are like things you could live by. Um, and, uh, and many people, I think, have come out of the experience with that idea that if I could do this more in the same way I'm surrendering to this experience, um, if I could surrender to other experiences I'm having and not try to control them, uh, that that might be really beneficial. So I think you're onto something, um, and it is something I've thought a lot about. Thank you. And your, your, yeah. your my question, question, Michael, what other countries are spending a lot of time and research on this? Is China, Russia? And so the question is, what other countries are spending a lot of time on research on this? China, Russia? Not China, not Russia. <laughs> um, uh, the, the countries that are, are doing the most work right now, besides the United States, are England. I think some of the most significant, we mentioned Robin Carhart Harris, there's a lab at Imperial College in London that's done some really fascinating work, both clinical work and theoretical work and neuroscientific work uh, to understand what's going on. Uh, the, the, what we were talking about, about the default mode network, that came out of that lab. Uh, in Zurich, in Switzerland, um, they've been working with LSD and psilocybin for many years, even when we were not, and they've done some very interesting work. Um, there's work going on in Brazil where ayahuasca is being studied. It's, it's a hard drug to study because it's actually two plants. Um, and uh, it's just kind of a dirty drug, as an American pharmaceutical company would put it, yet it's exactly the kind of thing you were talking about that may have various, there may be more going on than we even realize. But I asked a researcher, a Brazilian researcher, uh, who was doing a depression study with ayahuasca, 
uh, how how do you how much are you giving? What kind of dose are you giving? He says, I don't know. I just asked the shaman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you get that published in the Journal of Medicine. But oh there's God, also there's an eight, anyway. eight country study getting started in Europe for depression. So there'll be eight more countries getting into this in the next year. Oh my God, where do we go with all these questions? So my question is, we've got a panel here who's been all over the world and been exposed to many people. And one of the things that I saw in here is that um, when LSD is brought to somebody who's at a higher level, it can be like a um, something that you can walk into easier than you might. And so, I'm trying to say this right. Um, you mean someone at a spiritually higher level? Or financial, or, you know, like here you wrote, Hubbard invited Humphrey Osborne to a lunch at the Vancouver Yacht Club. Like so many others, Osborne was, Osborne was deeply impressed by Hubbard's worldly, worldly list, wealth, connection, and access to seemingly endless supplies of LSD. Mm -hmm. So we live in a world where these things are just, just that's what we're living in. Yeah, uh, so, people can't hear you, so uh, <laughs> can you summarize that? Good, that's good, because I wasn't very clear. <laughs> she says that's good, I wasn't very clear. <laughs> All right. So the question was, um, how do you see LSD in this world where it is accessible to people of wealth, Power. Yeah. And they are exposed. Well, okay, so the issue is about um, so, yeah, accessibility yeah. and class. Yeah, so the question is, what, yeah, what do you do when this is more accessible to people, yes, with wealth and money right. and other forms of access? Yeah, so right now, Village. yeah, people who, you know, to hire a psychedelic guide costs $1,000, $1,500. Um, it's not available to everybody. And that's why getting FDA approval is so important. Um, because once the FDA approves medicine, insurance companies are obliged to cover it. Um, and, um, and that's why that path is so important uh, to get regulatory approval. And, and the EMA in Europe, uh, where, you know, and in both cases, the, regula the regulators have actually been very friendly to the research and stand ready to approve it once they see good phase three studies. Um, but that's how you make it more accessible. Um, you know, people who want to do it on their own, uh, mushrooms are not expensive. You can grow your own mushroom. If you, if you know mycology really well, you can find your own mushrooms, but I don't recommend that. Because uh, there's, especially here, there's some lookalikes that are lethal. Um, so, but I, I think, you know, in, in this country, like with every other kind of therapy, um, yes, uh, it will be more available to the to the well-to-do, um, and the only, the best way we have to democratize it is make it a routine part of uh, of, of health coverage, mental health coverage. I wonder if people will just to learn how to perform the service and support for each other. To, you know, I grew up with a lot of drugs, and they were not expensive. And Peter is about to say that. He grew up with even more drugs, and a lot of them were free. So no, it's really not what I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to ask Michael if you had any knowledge about control, you know, in empirical double-blind testing. Has anyone used meditation as a control to psychedelics? Because anyone can sit down. Right. Right. No, it requires nothing to meditate. And so I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins has studied meditation. I don't know if they've done head-to-head -head comparisons, but they're very interested to learn what experience meditators could tell them about the psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I don't know that anyone's done a... Um, I mean, meditation is being used, mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques, um, uh, John Kabat-Zinn's approach is being used to treat addiction, for example, smoking addiction, and it's having success. Um, and uh, I don't know that it's being used for depression, but I don't, you know, given that it does take you to similar places, I, I, I think that that would be a very productive thing to study. Someone gave Suzuki Roshi, who was the man who founded San Francisco Zen Center, mm -hmm. someone gave him acid, 
and he went and he took it and he spent the entire trip in a closet because he said he wanted to see what the mind produced without light. <laughs> and there's a famous story about Ram Das, whose who's guru in India, I don't remember his name, uh, said, said what? Named Karoli Baba. Thank you, I knew in this room. <laughs> Uh, and his guru said to him, uh, what is this LSD you're, you know, you're talking about? Because he had worked with Leary at, at, at Harvard under the name Richard Alpert, his previous name. And, uh, and, and he told him, and the guru said, well, bring me some. And he brought him uh, you know, 300 micrograms, and uh, he took it and nothing happened. He asked for another 300 micrograms, and he took it and nothing happened. Sounds apocryphal to me, but I don't know. What do you think? I always thought that was a funny way to look for a guru. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a guy on the aisle who's had his hand up forever. Please ask your question. Thank you. It, it relates to what you were just asking about in terms of um, studies of meditators doing this kind of work. And I wondered if you were familiar with Andrew Newbert's work with neurotheology because that is exactly what he's doing. And I'm wondering if, if, when you talk in the book about the default mode network, if you are familiar with Andrew's work and how that overlapped with some of his findings. No, I haven't read Neurotheology. I actually, I think I own the book, but I haven't yet to read it. Well, there's, there's, there's a very bad book called Neurotheology oh. by someone who is not very reputable. So what's but, Andrew Nunberg's name? Andrew Newberg is a, he's an anesthesiologist in Pittsburgh, I believe, and he's been studying uh, meditators as well as Franciscan nuns and taking them into fMRIs to see what kinds of changes go through their brains when they have these peak mystical kinds of experiences. Thank you. I'll follow up. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. No Thank you, oh, loud, clear voice. Um, should we take another, a few more questions? Yes. Sir. A, a question about the intersection of LSD and food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I get all the time back. <laughs> no, Owsley, who provided so much LSD to San Francisco and beyond in the 60s, in the mid-60s, stopped eating vegetables. He ate only meat pretty much the rest of his life. What do you, what do you think of that? I mean, I, don't, I just didn't know what to make of that. I couldn't think of a better person than you to well, ask. Well, you just gave me well, my next question. <laughs> <laughs> you know Elsley, right? Yes, I did. But, uh, did he, he, he gave us one too. Yes, he gave us once 200 turkeys for the free store on Thanksgiving, <laughs> but I didn't know anything about his dietary practices. <laughs> So the, but the psychedelic diet, I think this is a book. What do you think? Yes, it does. Okay, where do we go from here? All these eager arms. This man has been raising his hand for about 25 years. Okay, yeah. okay, he's a friend of mine, so I'm trying to not pick on my friends. Well, thank you. Okay, so you've posited a context for this emergence, that, and you've named fascism, tribalism, non-women's equity, and climate. Do you want to just do it with a microphone? <laughs> yeah. you, you've named four or five perils in which we live, which are fascism, authoritarianism, tribalism, non-feminine, non-women's equity, and, and the environmental crisis. And the, and, and the climate crisis. You haven't named, and I've lived for the last six months in the shadow of an article that George Dyson published on New Year's Day called Childhood's End, Childhood's End which essentially says that the real peril is artificial intelligence, and we've already lost to it, and that the human enterprise as we know it is over. So I'd be interested in your reflections about psychedelics in the context of this recalibration of what human beings are. Wow. Wow. Good I, got, I got nothing on that. <laughs> I promise I would tell you. I haven't looked at artificial intelligence except as the way it is being treated as a model of the mind and how it works in terms of these these ways of accessing solutions to problems. Um, uh, you know, I, it's just something I haven't dug into. But, is it a way to take take back? Well, I, you know, what Rebecca was saying earlier, I think that digital culture in general um, 
you know, the, the psychedelic experience, which compared to digital experience is a very direct kind of experience, um, it, 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 it connects you, uh, whether to nature or to other people, it's all about interconnectedness. And digital life, we know, is a false social experience. Um, it disconnects us. Um, so I do think that they're intention. Um, but specifically with regard to artificial intelligence and the future of the, of the I, of, of the individual, um, I, I just don't know anything about that. There's a group in England, uh, I've mercifully forgotten the name, but a friend who introduced me to it is going to give a speech there. And there are people who are actively working on extending things like artificial hips, artificial legs, limbs, implants in the brain to cure Parkinson, to kind of create uh, bionic realities, and they're looking for a deathless experience. I'm not gambling on it. Yeah, and, and also, oh, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a great uh, Southern California creation myth where the gods debate whether we should be immortal, and the conclusion is, we should get the fuck out of the way so the place doesn't get too crowded. Silicon <laughs> Valley, <laughs> Silicon Valley obsession with immortality for these people who already have a gigantic carbon footprint. It's like I want to consume more than my fair share for all eternity rather than just <laughs> for a hundred years. <laughs> that sentence. <laughs> you know, this pursuit of kind of, it's also, and it goes back to this question about class, if it will become something, and like rich people already get to have better teeth and yeah, and there is a, health. And there is a, there is a element of that Silicon Valley community that sees psychedelics as part of the biohacking, right? Uh, the kind of thing you're talking about. This is another tool to improve our minds. And it's, quite, it's, a, it's funny because it becomes ego and it becomes a kind of self-aggrandizement yeah. that's antithetical to the egolessness and the boundarylessness that should make you, you know, also, maybe appreciate your life and be ready to get the fuck out of the way. Yeah, so I, I do think the most powerful, one of the most powerful uh, opportunities here is to have a very different conversation around death. Uh, the experience is very much about mortality, and um, and people have very interesting experiences around that. Um, and what what seems to happen is that they uh, they define their sense of self or self interest broader and broader and broader than they did before. They thought that their self, what they worried about dying, was their body and this individual. And many of them come out of the experience realizing, well, I am going to die, but I'm part of this larger thing that is going to survive me, whether it's community or nature. Um, I remember this one woman who uh, was uh, a cancer patient at NYU, and she described uh, an experience, a psychedelic journey, where she went into the ground, and she and she uh, she was going along in the ground and, and underground, and she hit a wall, and she said, oh, this is, and she knew it was the wall of a crematorium. And she says, oh, I'm going to die. And, her, uh, and she felt her body disassemble and be taken up in the plants. Um, that she was going to become part of these plants. And, and she, she came out of it feeling reconciled to death in a way she had never been before. Um, so that's the value. It's not about seeking eternity. It's, it's, I think it's about confronting mortality and, and having a... a one of the reasons I got into this that I don't mention in the book had to do with the fact that my dad was dying when I first started hearing about these uh, trials with cancer patients going on at NYU and Hopkins. And my dad, I don't know, I still don't know exactly how he processed the fact that he had this fatal diagnosis, this terminal diagnosis, and he, he really didn't want to talk about it. He, he just processed it very internally to the extent that he did. Um, but I needed to have this conversation, and, um, and I found this odd community of people, these people who had, had had a profound psychedelic experience, and they could talk about death with a kind of candor and openness and frankness that was, was kind of stunning. Um, and that owed to this experience that they had. So I, I think that's a huge social benefit. I mean, it's a conversation we're not having. And we tend to dull people's minds on their way out of morphine um, and the prospect of perhaps sharpening them. Is, um, is frightening to us, but I think could be um, enormously helpful to a lot of people. Two quick things. Two quick. 
nobody has any particularly strong feelings about artificial flowers. <laughs> they're not dying. And what makes flowers beautiful and precious is that they're dying. And that's what makes human beings precious, and that's what makes the phenomenal world precious. So the idea of immortality is consigning the world to be like a display in a museum somewhere. It's just, it's silly. The other thing I wanted to say is that years ago, 2,500 years ago, <coughs> Buddha explained about dependent arising. If this exists, that exists. And it only takes about 15 seconds to think, I've never existed without sunlight, without water, without oxygen, without microbes in the soil growing my food, without pollinating insects, you just keep going on to the Earth's place in the solar system. If we were nearer the sun, water would evaporate. If we were farther away, it would freeze. So when you talk about who dies, you can't even say who lives. And the reason that they call it an illusion is because we appear to be separate and individuated selves. And so are soap bubbles. But really, we're connected to all of it. Waves are always part of the ocean. And each individual wave may forget that it's part of the ocean, but when it collapses out of form, it's still the ocean. And that's, that's the part that doesn't get into public dialogue. And you can, do, you can reach that through meditation, you can reach it through psychedelics, but I'm not sure you can fix it through, you know, fix it in the sense of permanent through permanent psychedelics. Wave. Yeah. Oh, that sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, maybe this is a great place to end. We've gone over.